much is enough. When do you know if you've done enough for God? Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your fellow Bible bus passenger on this five-year journey through the whole Word of God. So how much is enough? Did you ever ask that question before you came to Jesus Christ? Well, if you study all the major religions of the world, nobody has an answer to that question, except those who know God's Word. The answer, of course, is we can never do enough to please God. We can't do enough good works. We can't offer enough sacrifices for our sins. We can never be good enough or holy enough or loving enough. We just can't do it. In our study of Hebrews 9, we learned from Dr. J. Vernon McGee that the Old Testament priests in the first tabernacle could never do enough either. Every day, they repeated the same routine as they had the day before. It was never enough. But the good news that we're going to see today is that Jesus Christ went once into the holy place because once was enough. Jesus did it for us, and God's holy and righteous payment was satisfied. When Jesus died on the cross, our greatest enemy, death, was defeated. He was born to die so that by his death and resurrection, we might have eternal life. That's the story that we celebrate this season, and it's the story that we'll be celebrating throughout eternity. We love to tell that story at Through the Bible, and that's why we share with you from the letters that pour into our office every day. And since we'll be celebrating stories like this in heaven, we figure that we'll get in the habit here on earth. Now, as you know, December is our special letter month when we ask you to send us your stories on how God is using this program in your life. Have you sent us your letter yet? You know, it's not too late. Just drop an email to BibleBus at ttb.org or mail your note to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109, or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C 6B1. Letters like this one from Kathy in Poway, California, are such an encouragement to us. For most of my life, I was part of a fellowship that I guess you could say is a cult, although I didn't see it at that time. The fellowship has no name, and they believe that they alone will be saved because they alone follow the Bible. Our hope of salvation seemed to be based on do it yourself and be worthy. Jesus was pointed out as our example rather than as our Savior. I was always afraid, discouraged, and saw no hope in life. And then I found Dr. McGee on the radio quite by accident and started listening. I couldn't believe what he was saying and started checking things out in the Bible that I thought I was so familiar with. I found out there is hope for me, not because of what I have or haven't done, but because of the sacrifice of Jesus, my Savior. I enjoy listening to Dr. McGee online and especially like hearing Steve's reassuring and friendly voice. Well, thanks, and thank you for everything. Well, praise God for the power of his word in our lives. And and thank you, Kathy. Thanks for being on the Bible bus each day and for sharing your amazing story. Next, here's a letter. This is from Miguel in New York. During a recent program, you informed listeners about Dr. McGee's booklet for those who had lost children. I downloaded Death of a Little Child and was very moved, particularly at the imagery of the shepherd ascending the mountain with the lamb in his arms. While reading it, it occurred to me that this comfort is tremendously needed by those of us who have sinned and aborted our own children. Over 20 years ago, in a time of terrible, stone-hearted selfishness, cowardice, and cruelty, I was part of this act of having destroyed a little life. My wife and I were breaking up at the time. What we had thought would enable us to have some advantage in our lives was proved horribly wrong. I have since come to follow Jesus, and while there is nothing I can do to bring my little one back, with the Lord's great mercy and forgiveness, I understand now that my child is with him. That God should permit me the privilege of his grace is beyond all understanding and is my sustaining hope when waves of grief overcome me. Thank you for presenting this critical biblical perspective and for helping me to understand that God can work through even the shortest of lives to demonstrate his immeasurable love. Wow. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks so much for sharing, and I'm sure that many listeners appreciate your encouragement today. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for your unfathomable grace and mercy in our lives. Bless us now as we fix our minds and our hearts and our wills to yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we are in this area where the emphasis is put upon the sacrifice of Christ and not upon the person of Christ. And yet the emphasis, when you begin to analyze it all through this section, is upon the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that's very important to see. Until you can recognize in him who he is and his authority, then you are not, of course, willing to bow to his plan of salvation. You'll still want to play church and go through a monotonous ritual. So let me just move back and pick up something that we went over all too hurriedly last time, and I'll lift out several verses as we go along. Verse 6 of chapter 9 says, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the worship, not service, but worship of God. And the little word always, they went always, it meant they went continually. They never finished the job. If they go today, they'll be going tomorrow. And if they go tomorrow, they'll be going the next day, and on and on and on. And I'm of the opinion that it became very monotonous over the years for a priest just continually to go through this ritual. Probably one priest would say to another, don't you get tired of doing this? And I'm sure that he would agree to that. It had to be repeated again and again, which meant that it was not satisfactory. That is, one time would not do. But we're going to see now Christ has entered once into the holy place, and only one time. It's only necessary for him to go just one time. That is very important for us to see, and I want now to just drop down to verse 11. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, you will note in your Bible that the little phrase for us is in italics. That means that it's not in the original, and it means it was put in to smooth out the translation, which is all right, and it is for us, but the emphasis is not there. The emphasis is upon a contrast that you have here. He entered once into the holy place. By having entered once, he obtained eternal redemption. Now, you want to turn that around? The priests, they went in continually. And they got a temporary sort of thing. They never got eternal redemption so that the blood of bulls and goats just couldn't take away sin. It covered it. It was an atonement. And it pointed to the time that Christ came. And we'll see that as we move on down in this particular section here. Now, as we move down, we come to the ordinance of the red heifer. And that's the sacrifice that is used here. And for that reason, I would like to come back to it. Now, when we were in the book of Numbers, I went over this. But I think we better come back to it and let me read it again. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve or to worship the living God? Now, they went through a ritual back in the Old Testament, and that ritual, as we've seen, it became monotonous. And frankly, I think uh, today worship can become very monotonous in our churches. don't think there's any question about that. And some people even think we ought to change our theme song. They're tired of listening to it. Well, may I say to you, that's our little ritual, I guess. That's the way we come on the air. And any type of a ritual that you just keep repeating it has a certain amount of monotony in it. Now, the blood of goats and calves... 
never could take away sin, but it got that which was temporary. That is, it pointed to the one who was going to come and pay for the sins of the world, but it never got eternal redemption. Now, Christ didn't go in several times. Once he went in, and it's eternal redemption. It now puts the authority and the importance upon the sacrifice of Christ, and it reminds us, and this will occur again and again here, that the life of Christ never saved anyone. You can follow his teachings and think that you're saved, but my friend, that never saved anyone. It's the death of Christ. It's his redemption that saves. Now he says the blood of bulls and goats. That speaks of his death for our sins. But it says now the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, that sanctify to the purifying of the flesh. But it never did, as he says here in verse 11, it's the blood of Christ that takes care of the conscience from dead works to serve or to worship the living God. Now, this is very important to see. If you go back to the 19th chapter of Numbers, and we're not going to turn back there and read it, but I would like for you to notice that here the heifer has a particular and peculiar meaning. And here the female is used. Well, we're told in 1 Peter 3, 7 that the female is the weaker vessel. Instead of a bullock here, our defilement actually comes through our weakness, you see. We're weak. Now, he took our place. He was crucified through weakness. He couldn't carry the cross. He came down and knew physically in the flesh your weakness and my weakness. Now, we are told back in the 19th chapter that it was a red heifer and must be without spot. The red, I think, speaks of the fact that Christ became sin for us, not in some academic way, but actually became sin for us. And you say, well, how do you know that red is the color of sin? Well, you remember Isaiah said in Isaiah one eighteen, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, that is red, though they be scarlet, they shall be white as snow. So it must be a red heifer, speaking of the fact that he became sin for us. Now the animal must also be without blemish. It certainly couldn't represent him unless it was, and he was wholly harmless and undefiled, separate from sinners. Now the animal must be also one that a yoke had never been put upon it. Although he was made sin for us, he was never under the bondage of sin at all. Not only the place that this is to take place is to lead the animal without the camp. And this was a picture of the fact that before the high priest, the animal was to be slain. And I think you have here a picture of our Lord Jesus. He is both the offering and the one he offered himself. And you have that depicted here in the high priest that's slain before him. And the blood of the offering was to be sprinkled by the high priest before the tabernacle seven times. Now, I hear people say that seven in Scripture is the number of perfection, only indirectly. The primary meaning is completeness, and it speaks of the fact that it's a finished transaction and that that one sacrifice takes care of the sin of a believer, and that's further carried out because the carcass of the heifer was to be burned in the high priest's sight again. You see that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and he freely gave himself. But probably we've never thought of the sorrow there was in heaven the day that Jesus died. Now, we're not through with it. We're told back in the 19th of Numbers that there was to be taken cedar wood and hyssop, and that was to be put with the sacrifice. Now, to me, I think this is rather suggestive. 
You remember the historian, the one who wrote 1 Kings in 433, said that Solomon spoke of trees from the cedar tree that's in Lebanon, even unto hyssop that springeth out of the wall. Well, I would say that he ran the gamut of trees and plant life. So he was a dendrologist, and he covered the entire field. This is what I think Isaac Watts called the whole realm of nature. Now, I believe that this speaks of the fact that he not only redeemed you and me, but you and I live in a world that's been cursed by sin. And actually, he has redeemed this world, you see. This world is now groaning and travailing in pain, but it's to be delivered. It's to be redeemed someday. Sin is to be removed. And we're told here a little later that even heaven itself had to be cleansed. Somebody says, my gracious, is it dirty in heaven? Yes, that's where sin originated, by the way. We're told that that's when Lucifer led the rebellion. And so that his sacrifice was quite adequate. It was complete. It was a finished transaction, you see. And it covers all of God's creation that's been touched by sin. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that was an offering far too small, Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Now, the ashes of this heifer were to be taken and kept up and then mixed with water. And I think that is with the Word of God. It speaks of the Word of God. And that it would reveal sin in the life of the believer. So that what we have here is something I think rather important, that the sacrifice of Christ looked forward to your redemption and my redemption. It looked back to the sins in the Old Testament, and they were saved. Abraham was saved by faith. How? He brought a lamb. Was that adequate? No. It pointed to Christ so that this looks forward and it looks back. And he speaks here something about purge your conscience. My friend, you and I have not really arrived until we enter into this marvelous sacrifice of Christ, recognizing his authority, that he has forgiven us our sins, and that we rest in him, we believe him, and we can pill our head at night knowing that our sins have been forgiven. You see, it's for a conscience. It is a conscience that's been made alert by the Word of God, but we can rest in the finished salvation. How many people today color their head at night, recognizing their sins are entirely, totally, fully forgiven, and that they are right with God, because He made it right, you see, and they rest in that. I heard the story of the man who had a little boy, and the little boy did something wrong, and went to his father and asked him to forgive him, and the father told him he would after he said, because you've come and confessed it, I'll forgive you. And so the little fellow in a little while came again and asked him to forgive him. Father said, oh, sure. He said, I've already forgiven you. And the little boy kept coming back, and he kept coming back, and he kept coming back. Finally, the father says, son, I'm going to paddle you if you don't quit coming to me. I told you I'd forgive you. Now, how many times do you find the believers say, oh, I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I'm saved. My friend, I think that he would say to you, I've already forgiven you. If you've trusted my son, I've forgiven you, and your sins are forgiven. We need to enter into that and rest in that. Now it says something about that he's purged your conscience from dead works. And dead works have to do with works that you do to get saved. Because you see, we're dead in trespasses and sins. And friends, all that a dead person can do is dead works. I've never heard of a dead person doing live works. It just can't be done. And anything that you do to get saved, it's a dead work. Now, and we need to emphasize this, Good works are never a cause of salvation, but they are the result of salvation. And therefore, 
to purge your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. But you see, the word is worship. And if you can enter into that, Christ becomes an authority to you, and you believe him, and you worship him. May I say to you, you know what you're going to do next? You're going to work for him. I had this in my Bible, the first Bible I ever owned. My mother gave it to me. It's a Schofield Bible. I do not work my soul to save. That work my Lord has done. But I will work like any slave for love of God's dear Son. How important that is. He's given out to us an eternal salvation. He's the mediator of the new covenant. That's for you and me. And not only that, but we're told, and he goes into this, we went into it last time, that he's made a will, and he died, and now it's in force, and it covers the blood that he shed, the death that he went through, covers the old covenant also, so that no one has ever been saved apart from the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood. And we saw that section in there where blood is mentioned six times in just a few verses from 18 down to 22. Now, it was necessary, verse 23, that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. You never shed bulls and goats blood in heaven. Now, that would be crude. But the blood of Christ, as we said before, we believe it's there, and we believe it's not crude at all. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands. These are just figures down here. The reality is in heaven. And now to appear in the presence of God, before the face of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the age, not world, and that's obvious here that world hasn't anything to do with what people speak of the end of the world. The Bible does not teach the end of the world. It does teach the end of the age. Hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself? You see, he came made under the law. He was under the law. And he appeared at the end of the law age. He appeared then, and he instituted a new one. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. Now, it's not appointed unto all men. Thank God for that. It's appointed unto man once to die. Some are not going to die. I don't know about you. I hear people talk today about, oh, they want to die and get in the presence of the Lord. I don't mind waiting. I told somebody that thought that I, when I had cancer, I probably should die. I said, well, I'll change places at you anytime and stick around. I'm no hurry to die. May I say that these are things that we need to keep before our mind, that he hasn't had to appear often, but once he's appeared, and it's appointed unto man, not all men, and after this the judgment, so that, my friend, if the death of Christ doesn't save you, there's nothing ahead of you but judgment. Oh, joy, oh, delight, should we go without dying, I hope I can live till he comes. I don't know whether I will. In fact, I'm not at all sure, but I know this I'd like to. No sickness, no sadness, no dread and no crying, caught up through the clouds with the Lord and the glory. When Jesus receives his own, oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long? That's still my question. Ere we shout the glad song, Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, Amen. Now he's going to appear the next time apart from sin. We're going to talk about that next time. You can see that there was a great deal that we passed over last time. And that's the reason we've come back to it. Will Jesus come in our lifetime? Wouldn't that be amazing? Or does that thought frighten you? If so, I plead with you to make sure that you know where you stand with God before this day is over. 
To learn more, go to How Can I Know God in the resources section of ttb.org to read more from Dr. McGee about how you can know for sure where you'll be in that moment when Jesus comes back for his own. We'll continue in Hebrews next week. See you then. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.